kids, Papa Duke here, and we're reading another episode from An Ordinary Occupation. Episode 6. When we left off, Rita and Pac and their village of Moor were joining their neighbors in standing up against the Roman taxes. Let's see how they're doing. Haraskar Lin, as the waterfall was known, was west of the Roman road and a bit north of the fork, along the old footpath that led to a stream called the Hera Burn. Rita gazed at the Lynn, water tumbling over the rocks as it had done since the god Magon placed them just so, ages before it became a meeting place of men, for hart and hind, for rabbit and fox, and for all to meet in peace. Chieftains and kings joined in council at the falls long before the arrival of Romans or Dalreda or even the Otenedai, he thought. Now there was another council, the first for Rita, and the future rested on the decisions they would make. Rita was both excited and terrified. There were many flat-topped stones, roundly arranged for sitting at the base of the falls, and the constant rumble and hiss of the water provided a cloak for discreet conversations. The early morning sun was casting streaks of light through the trees and mist, and it created an unearthly picture of peace and tranquility against the warlike posture of conversation. As Phelan spoke, Rita returned from his thoughts to, a ma to the matter at hand. We will travel by cart and foot. It will appear to any we should pass that we are delivering tribute to the Romans, said Phelan. And you can be at the north gate of the Hunan post as the sun rises, asked Alec, chieftain of the Dumnanai, who led a contingent of eighty on horseback and fifty charioteers. Phelan nodded. Good, he added. We will seize Habitincum while the moon is full during the night, and our troops will join yours one hour after sunset, or sun up. One hour after sun up. A tall woman with fiery red hair and red leather vestments stood and said, Then it is agreed. The Otenedai force will be at the fork at sunrise, and our archers will join the great charioteers of Dumnanai against our mutual enemy. Ella of the Otenadai, commander of forty archers on foot and one hundred by horse, was a hardened warrior herself. She then looked at the Gadonai delegates and asked, What news of Briganti? Our dispatch was sent two days ago, and we expect news presently, began Phelan. Pac will be there, added Rita with urgency as Phelan raised his hand at his younger tribesmen. It was not appropriate for any but chieftains to speak unless asked a direct question in this forum. Phelan added diplomatically, Indeed, our man Pac is clever and resourceful, and he has many acquaintances in the most unlikely places. He has told me the Briganti plan to rise up against the Romans is eminent. We need them to act in concert with our own schemes and actions. We must trust the gods to employ our companies in smooth production of a Roman purge, added Ella of Bren. Or rough deaths to them all, added another Dumnanai leader. The chieftains, and each of their sergeants and seconds, pulled their own drinking cups from saddlebag or side pouch and filled them with cold and clear water from the linn. 
Will that God, will that Magon and all the gods of right and might may look favorably on this venture, proclaimed Ella as she raised her goblet toward the sun, then turned the other direction and toasted the fading moon, just visible against a bluing sky, and everyone standing did likewise. Rita said a silent extra prayer for himself that his father and grandfather would also favor his actions in the coming days and would be by his side in spirit. Moore was shrouded in a veil of serious deliberation and sincere encouragement, one neighbor to another. Preparations were being made in a frenzied haste that afternoon before the attack. Dot was given the task of cutting laces and straps from a hide of deerskin. She had already cut it in a, she had already cut it in a hundred or more thin strips when she sat near the fire pit uh, for all to pick from. Dot found one for herself and was busy threading it with beads, feathers, a small piece of emerald silk, and a disc she had found which looked like a sun carved from antler or bone. She worked her fingers around with the intricacies in silence occasionally wiping a tear. She was so scared. The sound of many hooves turned everyone's attention to the west gate. From out of the canopy trotted a pair of chestnut horses pulling Pock and his cart, and more than a dozen beautiful horses trailing dutifully by loyalty and rope. The town of Moore let out a singular cheer and all came running as Pock commanded the hour. Where is Turnip? cried Dot, eyes wide and searching the team. She knows her way, young Dot. She'll be along soon, don't you worry, said Pock while climbing off of his two-wheeled cart. Looking at Rita, he added, What do you think of my chariot now? Dot took off the dead... Dot took off on a dead run up the road, where she found Turnip standing a mile away, wagging its tail and tapping a hoof as if to greet its young and ever so lively friend. While Phelan was, assist while Phelan was assigning horse to owner and Durg was corralling the animals, Pock told the tale of how he acquired such an asset of horse for the town and had so graciously adopted him just three years earlier. Pock did indeed have the hoard of gold and trinkets stashed in secret compartments of his cart when he was confronted by Granius. I thought it was the end, said Pock, eager to, always eager to talk of his own great deeds with flourish. But our friend, Pock waved toward Rita, the Moor intervened by insisting on his payment for the stallions, pointing to the corral. From Hispania, he said to a chorus of oohs and ahs, and Granius dragged him off to the Praetorian building where they kept the gold. So I naturally followed. On with it, said Rita, with some level of impatience. Well, well, Granius, who is the new governor general of all entire the entire wall, did I tell you? Oh, well, yes, so then, a rank far above his capabilities, Pock mumbled. On with it, cried Rita. Yes, the moor was given far less than expected, and so I offered him the three nested golden bowls of our find to balance his equation, explained Pock. He was most appreciative and, in turn, suggested that he should help me relieve Granius of the extra burden of twenty fine horses, the stress of the general's new position being too much for him and all. All of those within earshot, busy at their own tasks, yet listening to Pock with great interest, let out a great laugh altogether. The moor then made haste with his own black steed and pack horse toward the coast, where his very own ship is waiting to set sail for Africa, added Pock. Granius would be beside himself with anger, thought Rita. Good. The four o'clock hour of night came all too soon, 
and the moon looked eager to please from the western sky. All of the town's men and boys and all of the teenage girls were gathered around the corral, outfitting their new hooved companions like bridesmaids, cooing and whispering, assuring eternal love and grace if given loyalty and courage in return. Phelan, Cadman, and Badha had their own mounts and were happy to keep them. Derg was given a black beauty, Rita rode a chestnut, and Keelan was mounted on a stunning white horse which strutted as if it were carrying a goddess. Why, Syl and Fro all agreed Keelan was in fact some elfin goddess made mortal and they should kiss her feet. Phelan brought them, Phelan brought them back to earth by giving them the singular task of guarding the village from harm. They were, they were to protect the three elders, ten children, and all of the livestock from harm. Nola would supervise them, of course. Pac hitched his new team of horses to his cart and carefully loaded half of the beehives in front of assorted pots and packs. He would be leaving after this fight, going back to his family home. In very Eulinium, the Romans would be on the run, he thought, and once again Pac's clan of the K2 would claim the farm as their own. The mule, Turnip, would be left to the loving care of young Dot. The party moved out in silence through the west gate, and Rita followed behind, pulling the silver chalice from a side pouch. Dot! 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 He turned and yelled as he passed under the canopy of trees. Here! came a small voice from above his head. Dot was clinging to a branch with her legs as Rita reached up with his cup. Give this to Ma. Tell her to keep it until I return, he said, looking Dot right in the eyes. She leaned down and grabbed the cup with one hand while stretching the other toward him and put her charm of beads and feathers into Rita's hand. Bring this back to me. Promise me, she begged, tears streaming from her face. After a moment that seemed an eternity, Rita was gone. Well, they're going off to battle, and Dot is afraid that she'll never see them again. We'll find out tomorrow what happens. Night, night, kids. <laughs> and author of the story was Jim Pierce Reed. Illustrations, both visual and audio, by Douglas Black. James Rayner was the story consultant. Musical flourishments provided by Frank and Black. Papa Duke's Bedtime Stories is a podcast production of From Dark Water Studio, Chicago. And I am full staff, Papa Duke's virtual assistant. Join Papa Duke again tomorrow for another episode from the Red and the Gold series of stories of legend and history. Thank you.